Hi, everyone. My name is Gunjan Sial. I'm Transformation Executive at Emerald Technology Group, Inc. I have 14 years of experience supporting clients on their transformations with strategy, governance, and program management services. With me today, I have Raki Rahman. Hi, Raki. Hey, Gunjan. Cheers. Cheers. Cling. <laughs> Cling. I actually have coffee. Yeah, be careful with that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. So, so why don't you introduce yourself, Raki? Sure. Um, so my name is Raki, and I'm going to actually share my screen so you can see this quick Absolutely. I presented. Yeah. All right. Let me know when you're able to see my screen. Yep, I'm able to see it. Awesome. So my name is Raki. Uh, right now, I'm a solution architect at a consulting firm named Slalom. Um, I do have my a cute little website here if you want to go and visit and see what I'm all about. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. I uh, have uh, seven plus uh, years of technology consulting experience and I've, I come from a software engineering background of about two years. Um, essentially, what I do is uh, I work with big data and uh, mm -hmm. software engineering on the Microsoft Azure as well as a uh, open source solution stack. So for those of you who don't know what open source is, it means like software that's basically free to download and use. Mm -hmm. um, Developed by community is the best way to put it, right? That's exactly it. And the idea is because it's open source, everyone can use it. And so the value add and innovation just grows from there. Exactly. Um, and with regards to the work that I do is essentially anything with regards to environment operation, operationalization. So you might hear the words like DevOps, MLOps, data ops, anything else that ends with the word ops. Basically that means taking some sort of development and making it real. So essentially right. we, we make, I guess, any sort of software real. Um, uh, I've developed and delivered um, Azure environments for multiple uh, large uh, enterprise clientele uh, across Canada. Um, I have a aerospace engineering degree from uh, University of Toronto. Um, and yeah, and I've just put in some of the, I guess, certifications because a lot of us are interested in that here. Yeah, it's very um, impressive. Thank you. Yeah, so just very recently, I was uh, I was recognized as a Databricks champion uh, within North America. Wonderful. So that's hopefully, you know, as we do these sessions with uh, Gunjan, we'll get into exactly what Databricks is and whatnot. But I don't want to exactly. get ahead of myself. <laughs> Sounds great. So, Raki, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what a transformation means to you from an organizational point of view. Definitely. Um, so. From my experience, again, because I come from a very heavy technology stack, really a transformation means any organization has some sort of problem they're trying to solve, whether mm -hmm. it's an internal problem or whether it's a problem in society. Um, to me, a transformation is when an organization is able to pinpoint what their problem is, um, and leverage the tools around themselves, whether it's the cloud, right. whether it's whatever it is, um, in order to solve that problem in an elegant and intuitive manner. And yeah. I, I want to stress on the word elegant because that means you're actually using the tools um, that they were actually meant for, right? right. Uh, and, and when I see organizations that are actually able to do that, um, I would call that a successful transformation. Wonderful. It's almost turning a problem using the tools and their strength, as you said, right? Using exactly. what they're meant for and turn that into an opportunity as opposed to a problem. Exactly. Uh, and you, we see this, I guess, terminology in, in every other facet of life. Like, for example, if you're doing a 16 week body transformation, what are you doing? You're <laughs> right. literally just using certain tools and weights to use it properly for your good, right? So that, that I feel like is the- is Absolutely. The yeah, yeah awesome. use what it's meant for, what the, the strengthening point there is. Exactly. Wonderful. So maybe we could dive into how big data supports transformation. So uh, Raki, if you don't mind getting into that a bit more. Definitely. So let me go ahead and, and, and take a step back and kind of explain to you how, what this word really means, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that, um, you know, people that are non-technical or some of us that are even working in a technology industry, we might hear the words like big data, uh, machine learning, artificial right. intelligence, uh, blockchain. Like these are, you know, these are terms that are thrown around a lot. And um, there is a lot of value proposition to these terms, but I think what's really important is to be able to understand like why is there a hard dependency on, for example, 
um, on machine learning for AI. Right. That you can't have AI without having machine learning. And why can't you have machine learning without big data? And that's you can't right. have big data without the cloud. So I guess my, uh, that's, that's a lot of topics, essentially like three or four sessions. But my goal for us today is to really for the audience to walk away with a clear understanding of exactly what the heck is big data. Like let's right. put it into a way that you and I can actually understand. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to hopefully achieve in the next 10 to 15 minutes. So working in, uh, in, in consulting, one of the things that I get the privilege of doing is uh, uh, working across multiple industry verticals. And what I mean by that is, for example, healthcare and mm -hmm. uh, financial services or uh, security, right? All sorts of different clients, essentially. Right. So we might get questions like, for example, what is what is so big about big data? Like that word big, what does that mean? We all know data, right? Like it's two megabyte email is a is a data right, right? But what is so big about it that excuse me that that clients is essentially say uh, especially the ones that are non uh, cloud savvy is why can't i just throw uh, more hardware at my on-premises sql database so, mm -hmm. so you're probably very much aware that uh, people um, i guess up until now even they use these like sql servers and it's essentially like a big box where you buy um, hardware and you know like processors and and storage and throw it in and then you can run SQL queries and chug your data and and the world has gotten very comfortable with doing that and so if I'm an executive director that that's already paid X million dollars for a SQL server and I go to him or her and say hey big data they're like what's so big about it I don't understand I already have a massive SQL server right so that's the that's the question right um, does big data processing require some sort of special computers? So like, you know, like, yeah, we use the word big data, but like, is the computer actually special or is the computer just like, that's the next question. Is it just like regular computer, like this Dell laptop I'm running right now or the MacBook you might be running at mm -hmm. home? Like, is it any different or is it just honest computers, right? Right. Um, and and, and if, if, if that's the case, um, you know, how are you able to use that to process large amounts of data? Right. Like, how does that actually work? Um, the next question uh, from there would be like, what is distributed computing? I keep hearing that word a lot. Mm -hmm. And what do I need to know? Like, you might hear the word like scale up. Like, what do you mean scale up? Scale what up? Right. Like, what yeah. am I scaling up? Why am I doing it? Why should I care? And how is it different than the on-premises SQL database that I paid five million dollars for? Right. Mm -hmm. I bought those servers. Um, some other questions would be what's Hadoop, what's Spark, and why do these things exist? Why can't it just be Hadoop? Like, what do you mean Spark, right? Like, right. what's the fundamental? All the terms for? that start to blend into each other, it, right? The myriad it, of technologies. That's exactly it. And why, like, if you're someone who's trying to do big data, which one do you right. go for, right? Uh, like, I grew up listening to the word Hadoop. Like, that was the big thing back in, like, 2000, right? So, yeah. like, now why is it not a big thing anymore? What's going yeah. on? I'm not actually going to be able to get into Spark today, uh, but let's that's going to be for another session, but yep. we can take it one step at a time. And uh, like I said, uh, I already bought my expensive servers from Dell, for example. Why mm -hmm. should I care about the cloud? And what is the big deal about Azure Databricks? So I think, like, right. we'll answer the majority of these questions today. And then I think uh, as we come back, hopefully we'll be able to touch upon the Hadoop Spark and Databricks part. Absolutely. Okay. So with that out of the way, let me go ahead and, and paint a use case scenario for you. Let's, let's go back and let's just imagine that uh, we work for a, or you work for a online shopping website. Let's say you mm -hmm. work for uh, Amazon, just to throw it out there. Yeah. So your boss uh, comes by, uh, you're working for Amazon, you're a, you're a quantitative analyst that does Excel work a lot. And your boss comes by with a, with one of those like two terabyte ex, uh, external hard drives from Samsung. They're like a hundred bucks from Amazon <laughs> or whatnot. Yeah. And, and, and they come by with a two terabyte of that. And in that Samsung hard drive, uh, he or she has a one terabyte Excel file uh, that's got 10 years worth of transaction information that Amazon has had, right? Wow. Very realistic scenario. You could easily export out this Excel file that has let's say one terabyte of storage, yeah. uh, one terabyte size, and then you've got, let's say, all of your sales revenue on column J, and this extends on for like 2 million rows, right? You could have this. Like, I could yep. make you an Excel file that looks like that. And your boss comes by and says, Gunjan, I really need you to do this really straightforward task. First, I need you to open this Excel file on your laptop, this, this Dell laptop that you have. I need you to do a sum across this column J right here with this 2 million row, right? I need you to just sum these up. 
very simple Excel formula. And then I need you to send me an email by the end of today with what that number is, because I need to report it back saying in the last 10 years, we've made X amount of dollars, right? Very simple. Like if I, instead of giving you a 2 million row file, if I gave you like a 10 record file, this would take you three seconds to do yeah. drag and drop. Right. So you're like, okay, no problem. I'm going to go ahead and plug in this uh, hard drive into my laptop. Uh, and uh, I am going to open up Excel. So the moment you try to do that, uh, you're going to realize a couple of things. Number one, your laptop, your brand new $3,000 Dell laptop actually only has 500 gigs of space. Right. Like that's what Dell gives you and that's what you need. And so we, when you try to copy that one terabyte uh, uh, file that your boss wants you to open, you actually can't even copy it to your laptop because your laptop's out of space already. Second thing, you're like, okay, fine. I don't want to open it on my laptop. Let me go ahead and just double click from the Samsung external hard drive E and let's see what I get. Well, what Excel does is it, it hits you with one of these, uh, there isn't enough memory to complete this action. Try using less data. And I actually generated this from a, like a, from a real <laughs> screenshot. And the reason is because like from essentially the way a, something like Microsoft Excel works is when you're trying to open something on your laptop, it mm -hmm. first reads it from hard drive and then loads it into your RAM. So for right. example, you might have like 32 gigs of RAM. And so obviously 32 is less than a thousand. Um, and so it, it doesn't actually work. You can't actually open this very simple file on your laptop if you tried it today. I think uh, simple is an understatement, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and uh, so what you do is, you know, you, you keep on trying because you really need to get this file open and then your computer actually crashes. Uh, and you get this thing called a screen of death. Um, and this is because you're basically, this is called a RAM spill. Yeah. And so the more you keep trying, it spills. Essentially, my the point I'm trying to get across is this relatively, or what would appear to be a straightforward task of doing a sum across column J, we've just established that even though my, my, my $3,000 laptop that can do all these other things can't open a simple Excel file. Right. right. Okay, so with, with, with that out of the way, let's actually go a step back from our imaginary use case and basically look at the architecture diagram of what you and I just tried to do. So what we tried to do is we've got this large data file, right? It's a thousand gigabytes, uh, got two million rows, and we just tried to load this thousand gigabyte Excel file onto a machine that might have only, let's say, a 150 gigabyte of storage left. Very realistic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the end, essentially the, the, the bottom line is uh, we were unable to load this data due to the resource limitations imposed by a single machine. Right. So because we used one machine, which makes sense, I've only got one laptop to open one file, um, I can't really do this, what would appear to be a simple revenue aggregation, right? Makes sense, mm -hmm. okay? So you really need this job and what you realize is, okay, I need to be a little bit more clever and I can't just double click the Excel file and open it, let's, let's try to be smart. So what you, what you think is, okay, let's try to do this. What you realize is at your office, uh, you've got something called a local area network, which basically means like all your friends or all your colleagues' laptop are connected to the same modem. Mm -hmm. And you have the ability to share files with them essentially right. across that network. And so you're like, hmm, that's really interesting. So what if I took um, that file, that thousand gigabyte file, split it into 10, like 10 chunks, and I sent it over to 10 of my colleagues' laptops, so 10 Dell machines. Mm -hmm. uh, that should work because most of them have at least 100 gigabytes of space left. So essentially what you then try to do is you say, okay, I'm going to chunk or like the real word here is partition. That's the word. Yeah. You're going to partition this one terabyte file into 10 files. So one of the things you could do is, for example, rather than partitioning on size, what you would actually do is partition on date. So for example, mm -hmm. you would do one year's worth of chunk um, in each partition. So you've got right. 10 partitions uh, and you're going to basically tend those ten, take those 10 files and then just send them over very simply to uh, each of those uh, colleagues' laptops over the LAN, which should be relatively easy to do. Um, and then they basically copy it on their local hard drive and then they double click and voila, they're able to open it because it's 100 gigabyte and that's less than 150 and so they're able to open it. So. Mm -hmm. So what they do is you ask, okay, 10 of your colleagues to give you, do a favor and say, hey, take two minutes out of your day to open up this Excel file, do a sum across the J column for me, take that number, which is let's say like 
whatever, $3 million, $4 million per year, or whatever, and just save that aggregation, that number I need into like a very small CSV file, right? So it's just one number that's summed up over each of the, each of the partitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, just go ahead and drop those 10 tiny CSV files to this like one folder on my laptop, right? Just give it to me, give it to me within the next 30 minutes. And then once all your colleagues finally go ahead and report those 10 numbers back, you're like, yep, I've got the 10 numbers. Uh, you just open them up, put them into calculator, take the full sum, send it over to your boss in an email. Your boss is happy, you keep your job and you're done, right? So essentially what we, again, taking a step back, what mm -hmm. we've really done is taken that big data, which is big because it's bigger than the single resource limitations of one machine we've taken it right. we have systematically parsed it in this case on transaction date and uh, rather than using one machine we use 10 identical machines to divide and conquer the job mm -hmm. and uh, if you really think about it you were kind of the project manager in this little project because you were kind of sitting at the head. This is this is called master in computer science terminology. Right. And then uh, this is going to sound horrible, but like your colleagues <laughs> were your slaves uh, in this particular scenario. And you had basically 10 of them do the calculation, report it back to you. Uh, and then you basically sent the aggregated result back to your manager. And right. uh, what we're going to find is essentially what we just discovered right now in solving this problem, uh, which is, essentially my one machine can't open up a thousand gigabyte file. So I'm going to do a distributed computing. Literally that's right. what we just did. This is called a master slave architecture where you use the power of multiple machines to achieve something that one machine could never do. That's right. And uh, this is basically a primitive rem rendition of a, uh, something called Hadoop MapReduce, or, or as we're going to get into in our next lesson, hopefully is a, something called a driver executor, essentially the same idea. Right. Uh, it's a primitive uh, rendition of Spark. And that is a wonderful way to explain those concepts, let me tell you. Because I Thank remember you. learning about those in school and right. whoosh, the first time it goes over, goes your, over head. your head. But exactly. this is very relatable. Well, you can all, that's, that's the way, this is how I learn, uh, like the most complex yeah. things as well. Like first you have to have a simple analogy in your mm -hmm. mind and then everything else just fits into comes that. into pieces yeah exactly so this is the only last slide i have for you with regards to big data today so now that we talked about uh distributed computing this is kind of a like a sneak peek into our next session where we'll actually talk about like what hadoop is and what right. spark is this is uh kind of the the, the idea and, and basically what essentially what hadoop is 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 you'll hear the word uh hdfs which means hadoop distributed file system mm -hmm. so going back to our analogy if you take the sum of the total storage of yours and your friends or your colleagues' laptop, right. this is essentially a HDFS because it's cheap, it's easily replaceable. Like if any of their Dell laptops broke, then I could just exactly. go ahead and replace another one. And so that's what a distributed storage is. And if you think about it, um, we've got infinite storage here because all I need to do is just go and buy more Dell laptops and connect it to my, uh, my network. And I right. could literally host an infinite amount of data. And yeah. if you think about it, this is why the cloud is so cheap for data storage, because they've literally got redundant, easily replaceable machines like this that are sitting in a server. So you and right. I can store as much data as we'd like to. I think some interesting conversations come into play here, though, right? From a backup security and all those point of views. But Definitely. maybe we could save that for later, as you said. 100%. And this is yeah. where I, I can't simply start a cloud center on my in my basement, <laughs> which is because I don't actually right. have the the resources and the knowledge and the power and the air conditioning and all the other things you need right. to be compliant. But fundamentally speaking, those are operational issues. Those are not technology issues. That is true. Uh, but this is where I guess the kind of technology overall fits in. And then you've got these operational enhancements yeah. that come in and make this. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is the building blocks of it, right? Uh, in exactly. order to operationalize it, you need economies of scale to be able exactly. to. Exactly scale up such things exactly and this is where uh this is we're actually interestingly getting into something called yarn mm -hmm. so you mentioned the you mentioned the concept of uh scaling up and so right. essentially the way like for example let's say um you are out shopping on a website amazon website and then suddenly there's a rush for people to buy toilet paper oh <laughs> that example and a billion people across the world go to amazon.com and start ordering toilet paper 
the way Amazon is able to scale up to meet that demand is by using something called fundamentally yarn. It's a resource negotiator. So what it really means is let's say your Amazon website is running on a thousand servers right. and then it suddenly notices that there's a billion requests coming in. What it does is yarn, which is basically it's an engine that is very good at negotiating resources. Like its job is to make sure that whatever task is at hand, mm -hmm. I've got enough people on my project, like a project manager to be able to right. achieve those tasks. And so a yarn basically goes back to your cloud data center and says, Hey, I see a, a billion people logging in. You better give me like 10,000 more servers. And so right. instantaneously it scales up to meet the demand and suddenly your billion people can go in and, and, uh, and then I guess buy toilet paper. Awesome. That's another story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's Which is a yeah. use case people are running into these days, right? So exactly. again, another relatable one. Exactly. But that's where, like, essentially, fundamentally, it's all, all about yarn. You're just managing yarn. And there's, like, you know, tens of ways of doing that. But it's the, the technology is the same. It doesn't change. Absolutely. Well, this was so wonderful. Thank you so much for taking time to do this session, Rocky. And as you said, there's so much more to cover here. So if you're up for it, we'll definitely do uh, some follow-up sessions. And cheers again. Thank you. Thanks, Pinjun. Take a sip of your coffee now. Sounds good. It's a little bit cold. Thank you. Thanks, Gunjan. See you later.